I'll start in three, two, one. Final note, the burden on side proposition in this debate is to show you why criminalizing vaccine denials or deniers in this instance is going to go a long way in helping us curb the spread of COVID-19 and consequently reducing things such as the deaths and the economic implications that COVID-19 has had on a very large number of individuals. Three things I'm going to do before I give any analysis or extensions or argumentations, right? The first thing we need to all understand in this instance, what do we mean by vaccine denials or who are these that actually partake in the act of denying the, uh, the vaccines? We tell you, I think, five things under this one. The first thing we tell you that these are individuals who outrightly say that the vaccine will not work, right? They, they sort of now refuse the um, the. Uh, the functionality of that vaccine. The second thing we tell you that these are those who go ahead and reject vaccination as a consequence of that ideology that the vaccine will not work. The third thing we tell you that these are individuals who are more likely to be very vocal about their beliefs and their ideologies about that vaccine, whether it works and how they are not taking it. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth thing you get is these are those that are likely to disregard COVID-19 protocols. These are individuals that don't see the gravity of the existence of COVID-19 among people and hence they deny the existence of that vaccine and go out right ahead to sort of disregard these COVID protocols. The last thing on what we mean by vaccine deniers and denials in this instance, these are these are not premised on the medical ability of individuals to see, receive vaccination so that opposition doesn't come and say, but oh, we have individuals that can't get vaccinated because of health issues. We have a working medical system that is in a position to weigh up odds of actually having these people take the vaccine and should they be deemed wealthy, uh, healthy enough to take this, these are the individuals we are talking of. The second thing in terms of just characterization so that we have a good debate is where is this debate likely to take place? Two things. One, the existence of the place, the way in this instance we are talking about nations where we have availability of vaccines so that we are not told that vaccines do not exist. These are nations where secondly, the government has taken large actions in raising campaigns to raise awareness on the workability of those vaccines. So these people are purely not working on ignorance. The last thing on where in terms of just the setting we're talking about a time when we have a matter of urgency a time talking about the COVID-19 pandemic period and in this instance that is where we are setting the debate so that we can talk of urgency. The last reason for uh, the last thing on the idea of setting up this debate is what we mean by criminalize about four things under this one. The first thing we tell you that make it a criminal offense that should be tried by law but before I give you examples on how this is going to work we're going to apply the proportional of the law. That is to mean that individuals who inherently just outrightly say in public that I do not, <clears throat> I don't think the vaccine actually works, will not be sent to the gallows, are, go on, are not going to get hanged. We're just going to do either of the following things. We're either going to find them, depending on the gravity of how they deny this vaccine. The second thing, second thing, we're going to give them periods of imprisonment or exclusion from the society. The third thing, we could give them uh, <clears throat> community or social works that they actually do for the individuals. Cut some amounts of money from their pay grade, especially if these are big farms that I inherently don't see fines as anything big. So when we cut on their pay grade to reduce or to increase production costs, this is something that could likely harm them. I'll take the clarification before I start on argumentation, please. Are you going to are you going to criminalize people who refuse to get the vaccine? Yes, because we say that as a consequence, the individuals that say the vaccine wouldn't work, they have no moral justification for them to even take that vaccine in the first place. We've given you that as under characterization for what we mean by vaccine deniers. The first thing we're going to argue in this debate is the social contract theory. This seeks to interrogate the relationship that in individuals have with the state. This is the, the, the government in this instance when we talk of state. So what does this look like? It means that the government has some sort of responsibility towards the individuals of that nation. What does this responsibility look like? It looks like the state protecting these people and providing social amenities such as health. And in an instance where the government has fulfilled its role and provided the vaccines that are actually needed in this instance, we feel it's an appropriate response for individuals to take up that vaccine in itself. So we tell you that in this instance, an immediate response 
response is actually needed. The government took an immediate response of shutting down nations and all those things to sort of curb this kind of spread. So the government has taken two steps here to ensure the lives of these people are safe. One, it has actually put in place protocols such as social distancing and locking down of borders. The second thing, the government has provided vaccines, but these individuals discard the existence of the vaccine or even the workability of the vaccine. Sorry. So what these deniers do in this instance is that the spread, the, the ideologies they seek to spread to other individuals are those that are likely to discredit or disincentivize people from taking up these vaccines. What this means is that people inherently opt out of getting vaccinated as a result of those kind of ideologies infiltrating their own life principles. So this means is that they disregard the um, they dis we said earlier that these individuals who actively deny the existence of this vaccine will disregard or even refuse to get vaccinated. When they do that, they are most likely not able to follow COVID-19 protocols and all those kinds of things. So what this means is that we lead to an increased spread of this, um, the COVID-19 cases inherently increase in a country. And we know we have many individuals whose immune system cannot keep up with this. So in that instance, we increase the death rate. So we see in an instance where these individuals in of themselves, they, we see that the use of the vaccine doesn't necessarily cure COVID because that is not how it works, but it inherently protects individuals. So when we say that because of the life choices of a few have influenced those of many, the government is justified to criminalize it. The second point is that we have the reward system and how it works. Basically, it means if you do a good thing, you get a good reward for it. If you do a bad thing, you get a penalty, the punishment in this instance. Basically, I'm going to weigh up in, uh, when we're discussing on the economic implications of the lockdowns or even the um, the the policies that the government undertook to sort of curb the spread. What did the government do immediately? The COVID-19 sprout and all those kinds of things. The government took to closing down borders. We see the economic implications of all these things. We tell you that in most instances, things such as import and export are things that are really important when you have balance of scale and all those kinds of things. So in instances where the government has closed down borders, it has reduced international kinds of trades and all those kinds of things. So in this instance, really what happens is why why is it urgent that we should allow this should make these people take the vaccine right and in that instance after we've made them take the vaccines two things are likely to happen one we are more likely to curb the spread of the covid-19 two we are most likely to resuscitate dying world economies and the gdps that have been nose diving since the very start so what is the impact on economies in this instance we have increased unemployment rates because most um, businesses such as hotels and schools and all those kinds of things had to shut down people are not getting any sense of livelihood that means they turn to um, um, to shady ways of getting money, such as petty crimes, this has led to increased um, uh, tensions in society. The second thing we tell is that certain businesses necessarily had to sort of um, cut down or lay off certain workers to reduce production costs and all those kinds of things. So those are the implications of having COVID in the, in the economic arena and all those kinds of things. So what happens here? How does this ties back to the debate? We have deniers that have increased the spread of COVID-19, as we've shown you in the first point. The government has no incentive to open up the borders because one, it still has to fulfill that responsibility it has to the majority. So what happens in this instance, we have a prolonged lockdown period, prolonged periods where people cannot make money on their own, prolonged periods where people actually turn to unethical ways of getting this kind of money. And on that front alone, we feel that this reward system is justified where we apply the proportionality of the law to protect the majority. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, we will now have the first speaker from the opposition side. Okay, let me please. Let me arrange my papers. Can someone please uh, share the screen with a time on it? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Okay, whenever you're ready to start. Do you hear me? Yeah, yes, we hear you. Uh, it seems like Ismail has dropped out of this debate or the Zoom call. Let's give him a second to rejoin.
Okay, um, we'll give him about two more minutes. If he is unable to join in two minutes, um, we're going to have to have someone else from the opposition side give the speech. Um, you hear me now? Yes, yes, we hear you. Sorry, it was a Wi-Fi problem. I, my pronouns are he, him. I prefer my, my PYs verbally. So I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. Hello, panel. Today we came to oppose this motion as we oppose criminalization of vaccine denial. Why? We think it's unethical and it's an assault on human rights and in privacy. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's unethical and it's, it's unethical for the government to criminalize freedom of speech, to criminalize uh, body preservation and body, uh, and body audacity. So uh, why? Because it's the government uh, because uh, uh, turn such uh, vaccine denial. It's not. It's a it's the government mistake and fail. And it's uh, the government is overreacting and overpowering to correct its failure. And that this solution that the opposition team is proposing is is not going to solve the most of the problem and is going to make it even worse and worse what are our principles our first principle is human rights is libertarianism the right to every human being to liberty this our uh, to liberty our second principle is that we are dealing with problems we are dealing with the reasons we are solving the reasons of that problem we are not solving the symptoms and we are not blaming we are not blaming uh, we are we are not a, we are, we are not blaming the victim of this uh, problem. Now, three points to conceptualize before uh, before rebuttaling the first speaker of the opposition. First of all, uh, uh, the government failure. Yes, the government have made a lot and a lot of failures in dealing with in dealing in dealing with diseases such as COVID, such as HIV, etc., etc. It doesn't deal well with misinformation. It doesn't deal well with valuable information and guidelines and vaccine distribution. That's a real reason for distrust in the government. A second point of framing is why denial exists. Denial exists because people doesn't have the needed info, the needed intel to make a decision and to make a position from a situation and from a problem. They are just, it's ignorance. It's just people that don't have the info. They are uneducated. They, uh, they tend to, and a second uh, reason is that they distrust the government because of a reason or another. Distrust and ignorance are the reasons, and in our side of the house, we are dealing with the reasons. Uh, a, third, uh, uh, a third point to, um, to uh, third point to frame, and the question that the proposition team didn't answer is, why do we vaccinate? I mean, do we uh, we we vaccinate because of the uh, of information? No, thank you. Because of the herd immunity, we are seeking that we vaccinate the most number of people. Uh, numbers like such such fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent. We tend to vaccinate those who are in need, so the percentage of who are getting likely to get the to get the virus is lower and lower. Uh, uh, before going moving to my argument, I'm going to rebuttal some point of team of team opposition. First point is that they build their uh, argument on social contract theory. Individuals are harming others by not getting vaccinated, even when they are educated and have access to it. 
therefore government is legitimate. They say that government is legitimate in punishing them. First of all, are people really informed and educated about vaccination? I mean, in countries such as developing countries, you are blaming them and you are criminalizing them because they can get the vaccine. Is that just? Is that uh, something good? You are assuming that all people are educated and assuming that all people uh, know about the vaccine. A second point is, if I'm not getting vaccinated, how am I an assault to people? He is going to get vaccinated. Any effect or any disease, I'm getting that disease. He is vaccinated. It's his choice. And that's why he is not going to get that disease is going to have less and less symptoms. It's my responsibility. The government doesn't have the right to make a parenthood uh, decisions on me. Second point is that they are going to talk about the economy and the uh, economical effect. We are uh, the economical effect. First of all, I mean, uh, let's look at the city quo. I mean, in countries such as USA, 70% of the people are willing to vaccinate, which is able to make a herd immunity so that the, the, so that the uh, percentage of you getting the disease is lower and lower. We, uh, so it's a lot about, it's just a minority that are not going to get vaccinated. And it's their choice. And any consequence are going to let only them are scientifically proven. Moving to my argument. The first argument is a moral argument. Yeah. You are stating that it's a fair, that what, what the opposition team is doing is a parentalist legislation. It's an assault on human liberty and human rights. You are obliging me to make a change in myself to consume something that I don't want like to consume. As a principle, we can just make sense. The government doesn't have the right to let it an assault on human liberty. It's an assault on democracy. And there is no... Uh, it's my liberty, it's my choice. I didn't, uh, I didn't influence you badly. My liberty, uh, 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 if I don't get vaccinated, you won't get the disease. You will get vaccinated and you won't get the disease or prison one, uh, uh, a little bit of a uh, big symptom. Um, so uh, another point is that it's the government uh -huh. failure I mean. Why are we dealing with this problem? Government info campaigns have been very ineffective. We see leaders of countries have been ineffective of educating their citizens about the disease. We see Donald Trump don't identify false information on social media and doesn't have adequate fact checking. We saw that the government education failed. We see that the people were we still are educated well about biology and how that work, which caused people to deny vaccine efficiency. As a consequence, government has screwed its citizens over, especially minorities, causing distrust. Black people in America, lower caste in India, That's government caused distrust in vaccine, caused people to distrust government in the first place to do their best action. Therefore, as a consequence, government can't punish you if it failed you, People in poverty stealing food shouldn't be jailed. People can't help but deny vaccine, given the information they are fed. It's difficult to hold someone accountable for something that is hardly their fault. Detracts from the state holding itself accountable. It shouldn't punish citizens for its own failure. It should address them and correct them. That's what we are defending today. The use of violence do not allow for a certain kind of opinion to be voiced is not principally viable, especially when those opinion existence has largely been caused by government failure, amounts to tyranny, oppression, not fair governments. You talked about social contact theory. In the social contact theory itself, state cannot restrict rights when it fails to facilitate those rights to safely. Holocaust denial can't be decriminalized if you haven't done enough to educate people on the Holocaust. You are regretting yourself here, you are talking about social contact theory, while social contact theory is, is, uh, is supporting our theory. Uh, as a conclusion, what are we supporting? As a conclusion, as we say, the, the team opposition is the team policy is an assault on human rights. It's an assault on the well-being of a human uh, uh, by obliging people to get vaccinated. It's unethical and, uh, and does, it does not affect people who are getting vaccinated. So you are just uh, so you are uh, having a policy by saying that uh, by vaccinating people, you are making sure that they are healthy and all people are healthy who gets vaccinated is going to be healthy. And it's unethical to blame people because of the failure of the government in educating them.
where government fails you, it cannot hold you accountable. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, judges, please be aware that uh, speaker spoke for eight minutes and 39 seconds. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's please have the second speaker from proposition side, uh, Bonita. Um, okay, let me set up my timer on my phone right here. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to put my video on. I hope that's okay. Um, I will start in three, two, one. To reject or to accept, to be vaccinated or not, what do we want? Well, as proposition, obviously, we want to criminalize these people that refuse to be vaccinated. Before I begin on with my case, I'm going to start with a few forms of rebuttal, and then I will show you why in the presence of other alternatives we have taken today's debate. So the precurrent speaker brings about this argument of how it is unethical and it encroaches on people's human rights. But our first speaker even brought about the point of like, you know, the social contract theory. But for, for opposition to understand this even better, government has the right to act on a certain topic if an individual has refused to be vaccinated. And why is this? Because this individual poses a harm to other individuals and to themselves because in doing so this government has the right to criminalize those who deny these vaccinations our first speaker told you this she told you that she told you how government has provided this important information and how these people have been educated on the workability on that on this vaccine but here comes the precarious speaker in talking about how it is ineffective it's actually really funny when he talks about how the government has failed in educating these different people but the purpose of education is for these different individuals to learn different things about all these types of vaccines or all these type of covid mutants right the truth of the matter is that the virus is mutating this is something that we have to agree Opposition cannot tell us that in someone refusing to get a vaccine, that they will be miraculously healed. And also, developing countries do not have access to these vaccines, hence they aren't in a position to deny or do so otherwise. We are willing to trade off individual autonomy where these choices endanger the lives to increase the spread of COVID-19. So it actually makes sense when we tell you that we want to criminalize those who refuse this vaccine. Allow me to ask and bring up the answers for this debate. We have two questions, panel. Number one, why do we feel it's necessary for this to happen? And number two, what happens if we do not criminalize vaccine denial? Firstly, different homo sapiens of this earth that have been dying all around the world have this new way of protecting themselves against the coronavirus. While opposition might bring the argument of human rights, human rights are not going to stop a particular person from falling ill and catching this disease when they could have had this vaccination. We feel that the deaths that are inevitable in both worlds can be reduced drastically on our side. Meaning what? That these different human beings that contribute to these different economic systems would be able to even upgrade their systems. We all know that in the beginning times of like this pandemic, most, of, most countries had their economic systems drop very drastically. But we feel that even with the fact that people are going to get, you know what, vaccinated, that means that more people are going to be able to go to their workplaces. And that means the economy of these different countries will rise even in this hard time. One thing that we also have to know is that safety, safety is very important for all these different human beings. And we see that it is something that is, you know, very little in opposition's work. A truth that we have to face is the personal losses that we have faced in this experience. One, kill, one can't help but wonder, let's say if my mother, if my mother got the vaccine, would she still be here? 
Well, no worries for you because as proposition, we tell you that these questions would be answered. Why? Because this person would have gotten the vaccine and let's say if they were to die or to go to heaven, then your question would be answered, right? Second question, what happens if we do not criminalize vaccine denial? First of all, high risks of death of, the, of these certain individuals. And while death is something that is inevitable, we feel like the process is quickened very fast on the side of, you know, opposition. And with more people dying, how does it affect the very society that people are living in? Well, this is very obvious why, because, you know, a large sum of people dying means that your country's economy is going to plunge. But getting a picture risk view of this would even mean that an economy that has drastically plunged, that means that these different people would, let's say, either taxes would be increased during that time period or so forth and so on. But proposition has to show us even their denial, people are going to be still safe and protected, which is something that none of us see happening with the fact that they're trying to promote vaccine denial. We feel that it is mandatory and everyone should be vaccinated in order to stop the spread of, you know, corona. But moving on, let's paint worlds, right? Like the artists that we are, let's actually get a canvas, a paintbrush and paint. And let us paint the different worlds that all of us is giving you. Let's start with the negative world, right? What do we see in this world? We see that people are being able to make their own choice, but in the end, we see that their choice would either lead to their death or the deaths of others. How do the people in this world look like, panel? This means that more people are going to die, more sorrow, more sadness. You know, the whole package that comes with death and someone dying, you know, of corona. You understand how that picture looks like in your head, right? Because most of us have been through that phase when we have lost someone that we love. Now, come over to our side you know, still with the canvas and the paintbrush and everything else. In our world, we see that these different people that are being protected because of, you know what, this vaccine are having a better life, meaning that there's more chances of safety and less things to worry about in terms of COVID-19, which is something that, you know what, opposition cannot provide in today's debate. Today's debate being on the topic of criminalizing vaccine denial is also speaking on the terms of society right now. What would people do if, you know, someone refused to get vaccinated? That is a question that we have to ask ourselves. But seeing how far we have come as individuals and survivors of, you know, this ongoing pandemic, we feel that it is very, very correct and very good for anyone to be vaccinated. And there should be no such thing as denial. Whether we are encroaching on people's rights, we feel like the government has the mandate to say, you know what, just because you don't want this vaccine, you have to get it to keep others safe. And it is on those grounds that we are very proud to propose. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, judges, please be uh, please take a note that she spoke for seven minutes and 42 seconds. So um, without further ado, let's please welcome the second speaker from team opposition, uh, Ali Up. Um, okay, one second, I'm just going to set up my timer. Okay, I'll begin in three, two, one. I will do three things in my speech today. Number one, I will respond to the proposition's arguments. Number two, I will outline my first argument about how criminalization will make people with illegitimate concerns more doubtful of taking the vaccine and discriminate against people who have legitimate concerns. And finally, I will reinforce the principled argument about freedom of speech and bodily autonomy. But before I begin, let's be clear. We are not, as 
opposition. We are not promoting vaccine denial. This is not what this debate is about. This debate is about whether governments should be criminalizing, jailing people because they choose not to take the vaccine because of one, misinformation or mistrust in the government. Instead of criminalizing vaccine denial, we are advocating for governments asking themselves why people aren't taking the vaccine and answering these people's concerns. Jailing them and criminalizing them is the easy answer. The, so, and I'm, I'm now going to rebut the, op, the proposition speaker. The proposition speaker in their speech has talked to you about how developing countries do not have access to vaccines, and so they're not included in, the, um, in this debate, which is completely false. Developing countries do have access to vaccines. They, however, have not been efficiently educating their masses and their citizens about the vaccine. So it's not enough for proposition to only engage in a world where everyone is educated and choosing to be hard headed and not taking the vaccine. Governments criminalizing vaccine denial no, is legitimate. No, thank you. Government info campaigns have been very ineffective. That's the reality and that's the truth. Leaders of countries have been ineffective at educating their citizens. Take the example of global superpower, the United States. Donald Trump, throughout his years as president has expressed doubts about the vaccine and doctors like Dr. Fauci. And by failing to educate the masses, people will deny, governments will lead people to deny vaccine efficacy. Therefore, governments can't punish you because they failed you. People in poverty steal food, so they shouldn't be jailed. This, this distracts the state from holding itself accountable. It shouldn't punish citizens for its own failures. It should address them and correct them. The use of violence to not allow for certain kinds of opinions to be voiced is principally wrong, especially when those opinions exist because the government has failed to do its job. And so I also want to re respond to the point about criminalizing people who don't take the vaccine, how they would they would hold them under periods of imprisonment and exclude them from society. This gives corrupt governments and government with restrictive speech me measures the power to imprison people. But what do those conditions actually look like? Yeah, In developed man. countries, these imprisonments look like run-down jails who infringe upon these citizens' personal privacy and comfort. Essentially, panel, the proposition is encouraging yeah, governments man. to overreach their power and abuse citizens' rights to bodily autonomy, which is principally wrong. Now that I have responded to the proposition, I will turn to my first argument, yeah, which is about how, no thank you, criminalization will make people with illegitimate concerns more doubtful of taking the vaccine as well as discriminate against people with legitimate concerns. The context for this argument is as follows. As explained by our first speaker, there exist groups of people who criticize the vaccines or who don't believe the vaccines for a variety of reasons. Number one, they might not be satisfied with the vaccine's efficiency. They don't trust the government. So they subscribe themselves to conspiracy theories about the government's malicious intentions. And they believe that governments are hiding political agendas. Or number three, they're minority groups who do not trust the government because the government has failed them before. Take the example of oh, African Americans having a larger percentage of people hesitating to take the vaccine because they don't trust the system. So why is criminalizing vaccine denial going to worsen the situation? The issue with criminalizing yeah, vaccine, no thank you, I will not take a few at this moment. The issue with criminalizing vaccine denial is that it increases these groups' doubts in the government. If the government begins arresting or fining people for not taking the vaccine, people will begin wondering why the government is taking such radical decisions to ensure that people take the vaccine. So what is the analysis? Yeah, a lot, no thank you, a lot of people are already have restrictive speech measures. These restrictions largely have to do with ensuring that there are no criticisms of the government. These are the, this is the perception that people have about anti-speech laws. So when you associate vaccine denial with these respect, restrictive speech measures, it makes people think that there must be something wrong with the vaccine and that vaccine denial is being re restricted because the, the government doesn't want people to criticize the vaccine because there must be something wrong with it. So yeah, radical right. measures like recriminalization scares off people. Citizens will begin doubting what the government's true intentions are in enforcing vaccines. And this has two clear impacts. Number one, this will only add fuel to conspiracy theories about government's malicious intentions. So consequently, people yeah, that subscribe to these theories, though, thank you, will be further discouraged from taking the vaccine at all. And people such as minority groups will further be discouraged from taking the vaccine. Number two, people who were initially okay with taking the vaccine might change their minds. After seeing the government's radical punishments and consequences for vaccine denial, people who were initially yeah. willing 
to take the vaccine will back out. No, thank you. On both sides of the house, the end goal is clear panel, having as many people take the vaccine as possible. But when proposition criminalizes vaccines, it, a vaccine denial, it is decreasing the numbers of people willing to take the vaccine. Again, the moment that vaccine denial becomes part of restrictive speech measures, it makes people think that there must be something wrong with it. That vaccine denial is being restricted to ensure that there are no criticisms about it. In the case of minorities distracting, distrusting the government, the government criminalizing vaccines further increases these groups' distrust in their government, distrust in vaccines, and thus the total amount of people taking the vaccines at all. So the proposition's goal of having people take the vaccine backfires. The proposition asks, why is it all better on our side? Why do we have more people taking the vaccine on our side? Why? is the COVID-19 going to decrease on our side? The reality is, is that when you're not forcing people to do something, when you are actually encouraging and educating the masses instead of just jailing them and putting them in restrictive ostracization measures, you're actually telling people and answering their concerns about the vaccine. If someone has a concern about the vaccine and posts it online, instead of jailing them and telling them they're spreading false information, on our side, we are having governments respond actively, taking the active measure to make sure that people are okay with the vaccine vaccine. Jailing them and criminalizing vaccines, like I said, is the easy way out. And so this also discriminates people with legitimate concerns because propositions policy would force people to take vaccines that might A, result in some health issues, and B, actually infringe upon their religious rights. There are certain religious communities who cannot take any vaccines because of their religion such as Protestant Orthodox groups who believe it is immoral to insert needles into their skins or other religious groups. And so that would infringe upon their religious rights, which does not fall under the proposition's framing. And this would also force people to take a vaccine that might result in dizziness, might result in fevers, might result in side effects that they're not comfortable with. And so it infringes upon people's bodily autonomy, people's freedom of speech, and it does not result in more people taking the vaccine. So for all these reasons, I proudly stand for opposition. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, judges, please note that she spoke for seven minutes and uh, 28 seconds. Okay, uh, please welcome the third speaker from the proposition side, uh, who's, who's Zifa. Yep, hello, sorry. I won't be able to on my camera, unfortunately. It doesn't work. Just That's... give me a moment and um, I'd like the, the timer on sure, the- Sure, sure. Sure, no problem. <coughs> um, one second. Okay, um, sharing whenever you're ready, please start. Sure. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to start off in three, two, one. The second opposition speaker poses a massive problem in opposition's case. See, their case uh, revolves around three concepts that can constantly be used to engage whatever is being said. See, to put it simply, opposition have based their whole case off of best case scenarios, illegitimate lies, and fallacies, something that we won't condone in this debate. Let's start off from the first opposition speaker. They come over here and they start giving us these massive blanket statements, which quite frankly are exceptionally problematic and highly offensive. They come over here and they give us many blanket statements. They come over here and they're like, oh, it's an insult on human uh, privacy. It's a humanitarian crisis. The government can't be trusted. Denial should, ex I mean, they're saying that denial should exist. It's better like this. This. We shouldn't vaccine. Nobody knows what's inside these vaccines. Vaccines lead to side effects. A plethora of misinformation that simply isn't relevant in this debate and is highly problematic to understand what side opposition stands for. But before I go into more detail about how the first opposition speaker might not have a brain, let's look at the second opposition speaker and start drawing parallels and see how they're end goodening their speech, trying to perfect it by stealing ideas and essentially changing what they started off with. Now, the first speaker comes over here and says, we do not deny that the vaccine isn't effective. But what we did say is we don't condone side proposition jailing people. 
something that is highly problematic because not once has side proposition said we jail people if you've taken the, you know if you've taken the liberty to listen to what our first proposition speaker said you'd understand even if you were a dumb man that that it was a simple concept that it was about tapping um, um, it was a slap on the wrist to make people understand that the vaccines are good for them and it would affect society in a negative manner if they didn't take it thus they would be punished in a in, in a monetary manner right but we also have to look at the parallels again from the second speaker they start coming over here and they keep drawing ideas about how we would incarcerate people how we'd essentially strip them of their rights and throw them in jail and treat them like pigs something that is highly problematic in this debate and is simply not true and is exceptionally concerning but let's still listen to what the second speaker had to say because even a nursery student could listen to this and explain to you why it isn't relevant probably not true and very easy to engage okay first of all they come to us and they give us these ideas saying oh you know these vaccines simply aren't good some people don't think it's ethically good for them it culturally isn't good for them so we have a few pieces of rebuttal for that right first of all these people would be drowned out by the numbers they have admitted on a majority of situations that these people are a minority of uh, are a minority group so if we look at the world as 7 billion people we will happily take it such that 99.5% of the world takes the vaccine because for the rest of the 0.5% they're on their own by that point in time it is survival of the fittest that's a right b that is an exceptionally big best case scenario in which everybody sees you know, um, uh, a punishment as a sign of the vaccine being flawed. It, uh, we have to ask a few questions. Like, for instance, when you're when you're driving exceptionally fast on a road, do you think people who get caught start suddenly thinking it's a government scheme to stop them from killing babies because it's your inherent right to not, I mean, to run people over? It's something that is so illogical, so simple, but it's hard to believe that side opposition are incapable of understanding it. But let's also come back and look at the stuff that is simply blatantly incorrect. They come over here and they tell us about how dizziness is a massive issue, how you'll catch a fever and you'll get, I mean, vaccine arm how these things are awful and it's simply a humanitarian crisis on our side of the house we've got a very strong stance and it might be offensive but it's simply true it is much better to take a week's worth of side effects than to die of the vaccine than to put other people who can't get the vaccine at risk than to put other people at risk it's something that is so simple so inherently stupid to argue about but we still hear it on a number of occasions from side of proposition sir. But let's go back to the first opposition speaker and take a moment to try understanding what he's saying, right? So the first opposition speaker had a grossly incorrect speech with, uh, with, which through disgusting description portrayed a series of harmful lies and fallacies which simply um, lacked any common sense and or relevance slash truth, right? He had a number of blanket statements and we had to question whether opposition's case is really as strong as they make it out to be, okay? In Op's best case scenario, we offend somebody and potentially stop them from dying, right? Slash spreading the vaccine. Try to understand that judge. In their best case scenario, we will offend somebody. In our best case scenario, one less person is buried today, right? But if the cost of saving lives slash rejuvenating the economy, making flights work again, making uh, making people go out to parks, spending time with their family is being offensive on our side of the house. It's unfortunate to say it, but it's a trade-off that will take any day of the week, right? They also paint these disgusting uh, as proposition first, uh, opposition first speaker also paints these disgusting pictures, uh, pictures saying the government can't be trusted, which simply isn't true. And it's again, it's another parallel that we'll draw to the second opposition speaker. The second opposition speaker then uh, uh, comes over here and they say some things that are exceptionally problematic. They're like, oh, on our side of the house, we We'll use the government to be proactive communicators and we'll try showing people how the vaccine is effective. Notice how they're incapable of picking a side. So is the government a bunch of lying pigs or are they proactive communicators that will walk your hand through the vaccine process? They never once decided what they wanted and it's pretty obvious and apparent that they look like a lost child in an amusement park definitely confused and they're incapable of understanding what they're doing right but we like to think and this is something that we're going to walk away with we like to think that of the seven billion people on us on, on uh, only a small minority are as smart as op one say right suppose we take them on the best case scenario only a small percentage of people in you know that use logic which a majority of people do that's why it's called common sense a majority of the people will still get vaccinated because they understand that the vaccine is inherently useful. What do we tell you? On our side of the house, 
we have shown you on a major uh, uh, on a timeless amount of we have shown you time and time again right that desperate times call for desperate measures we want to push for more people to get vaccinated for a very simple reason because if they don't get vaccinated there'll be another mutation and the last vaccine will become less effective making it uh, making it thus that we're further away from the light at the end of the tunnel on their side of the house they're giving too much priority too much power to things that are simply useless and shouldn't be considered in a debate that could affect the history of mankind Right, so. but with that being said, we also have to understand where this stands from a point of clashes. If we understand this as a third speaker, where it's very easy to see that on most clash points we've won. We've won on the concept of efficacy. We've won on the concept of efficiency. We've also won on the concept of uh, uh, being ethical, right? Because at the end of the day, the most ethical outcome is generally the simplest one. And our side of the house, we have a very simple claim: we're going to save lives. Right, we're going to stop people from dying. Less families are going to be separated. I'll take you with less than ten seconds of my seven. Yeah, okay. I'll take you. So would you force someone to get vaccinated at gunpoint? I don't understand why you think this is such a standoffish thing. Do you think we're holding a gun to somebody's head and saying, if you don't get vaccinated, I'll shoot your kids right now? That isn't the case. We've shown you the repercussions. It's something that our first speaker told you about. There would be monetary fines. Similarly, how in countries like Dubai, if you're caught not wearing a mask in public, you'd be fined. So in this instance, if you haven't taken the vaccination, you'd be fined. No one's going to throw you in jail. We're using logic. Unfortunately, you guys haven't. Thus, you're under the impression that we'd be throwing people in jail you know, sentencing them to life in prison because they haven't taken the vaccine. And we've justified why we think these people should get such dire uh, repercussions in this instance, a monetary fine. With that being said, with less than a minute left, judges, we have to draw a few parallels. Let's look at their best case scenario and our best and our worst case scenario. In their best case scenario, people can feel self-entitled and great because they showed it to the government. They showed the government that they can't be offensive to them. On our worst case scenario, we've offended somebody, right? But in their worst case scenario, millions of people are going to die on a daily basis. The economies will never open up and will continue to live in this huddled, uh, this huddled excuse of a society. Judges, I call upon you, please, I beg, vote for side proposition if you vote for a side that chooses to use logic in a debate without logic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, judges note that uh, speaker spoke for eight minutes and 20 seconds. So um, let's please welcome the third speaker from the prop up opposition side, uh, Christian. Um, okay, I just want to check if my video will work. Okay, can you guys see me? Yeah, can you guys oh, see I'm me? Sorry. You... I'm sorry, I said yes, I forgot I was muted. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, just is it a time on the screen? Yes. Uh, there we go. All right, timer's on the screen. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, side opposition makes it seem like unless we force people to get vaccinated and find them and as the first speaker said send them to jail or remove them from society or make them do uh, civil service then all society is going to collapse no one's going to get vaccinated and the mutations are going to get worse it, it, it's simply false in places where there's ready access to vaccination we agree there are there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy and a lot of people are quite hesitant to get vaccines but that vaccine hesitancy isn't more than 30 percent of the population or even 40 percent of the population which is what we need to achieve herd immunity so herd immunity preventing more people from getting sick and preventing mutations is perfectly possible even if we ignore all of the people that are irrational and we we think that we're better and we would be fast if they got vaccinated but it's not this doomsday scenario that side of proposition makes it sound so so they have never proved to us proven to us that the situation is so bad that vaccine hesitancy is so widespread that these sort of measures are necessary the reason why my poi is necessary or the reason why they don't fully understand is because that all but what they don't understand is that all forms of government regulations, when the government says we're going to criminalize something, is a form of violence. Now, it doesn't seem like it's government, but it actually is. Because something as simple as a fine. What happens if you get a fine and you don't pay it? Well, you are reminded to pay the fine. If you keep refusing, someone comes to your house and arrests you and for not paying that fine. If you refuse to get arrested, more police officers will come to arrest you. And you refuse to go to the police station and you fight back, they will shoot you. 
So every government law, every fine is something which is done with the threat of violence and coercion at the end of it. Now, there's also a bit of a contradiction here where he says, no, we won't imprison you. But if the judges take their notes, and I wrote it down in here as well, proposition first did say that we will send you to prison as long as it's proportional, right? But it's still at the end of there, whether it's fine or prison, it is still a form of government violence, which is being used to coerce people into doing something. And they try and mitigate like, oh, yeah, you just get a fever. Listen, 0.012% of people that they get the AstraZeneca virus will have an adverse event like anaphylaxis and they will die. Now, that's not a significant amount. In 10 million people, that's about 10,000 people. And the it's definitely few people that will die as compared to if COVID would spread. But you can't force people to make a risk, uh, uh, make a decision on whether or not they're going to die. And these side effects can be quite severe. Like I've had the vaccine, I had to stay at home and I had a fever. But you can't force someone to have a violent fever where they can't sleep or work for days at end, where many people have to go to the emergency rooms because of, uh, the, the vaccine side effects are so severe for them. As much as it's good for society and so forth, you can't force someone to do that. You, you, you can't, similar to how doctors, for example, even if it's not going to be that inconvenient, we can't take you, strap you down and, and withdraw blood from you, even if it's going to save many, many lives. Because we understand that bodily autonomy is important. Even if it's proven in many countries that, like, for example, the life of a child is important, the life of the unborn child is important, we still allow for abortions because we understand that bodily autonomy is important. For them to simply disregard it and say, yeah, well, human rights won't stop you from getting sick is not enough, right? We think they have to actually engage with us and say why the government is legitimate in reducing your bodily autonomy by forcing you to have a needle put in your arm, which injects a substance which could make you sick, which could potentially kill you, even though the risks are low, and which could cause severe discomfort to you and could be against your religious beliefs and could be something done to you by a government that you do not to in the past. We think that's something that they simply haven't dealt with. They've done a lot to insult their intelligence. They haven't done a lot to actually deal with our arguments. So let's talk about the social contract on a principle. Protect those other people you're putting at the mattress um, and you are making them sick, right? And that's all very well and good. A few responses to that. Firstly, we would say that the majority of the issue they have in terms of making other people sick, the virus mutating and so forth, can easily be dealt with, right? To say that the COVID regulations should be applied and should be applied more strictly. Right? They can't just say, oh, these people avoid COVID regulations. Well, we agree they should be fine. They should be put under COVID regulations. You can't go around making people sick, especially if you're unvaccinated. And if you're unvaccinated and there's a higher chance that you have uh, COVID, obviously we can't let you go to public places or go to concerts or do whatever you want because you're not vaccinated. Obviously, certain privileges will be restricted. That is definitely going to be enough to stop these people from doing this. And that's what happens in the status quo. But moreover, they don't deal with the fact that the, 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 the social conduct theory has not been upheld in these instances where the government has failed to adequately educate them. The only reason why people would be vaccine hesitant in the first place, if it is true that the vaccine is so miraculous, is because they have been miseducated or because they have not been given the, for example, education on how to be proper critical thinkers, right? That is a failure of the government, which is the government's fault. You cannot punish someone for that. Like if the government did not control the spread of rampant propaganda of racism throughout a country, or like what happened with the American election where Russian hackers spread all this misinformation on Facebook, the government is responsible for that, not the citizens who were uh, uh, you know, at the harm of all this misinformation that was spread towards them, right? We've already talked about Bolly Tommy, but understand, there's nothing about the social contract or the fact that a bunch of people came together and created law, which allows other people to decide what substances should go inside of your body, right? It's true that you shouldn't be able to make other people sick, but it's fine. I mean, we only need herd immunity. He does, they don't consider the fact that as long as, even if 30% of a country, like in a country of 10 million, if 3 million people decide not to get vaccinated, the, the virus can still stop mutating, can still not be spread to people. Like that's how herd immunity works. So it's perfectly legitimate for those people to make those decisions for themselves, as long as they stay away and as long as they uh, adhere to COVID regulations, which the government will punish them for doing it. So they haven't actually, on a principle, but the state is legitimate in doing this, given that the state has other ways of dealing with this, and given the fact that the majority of people, if they are persuaded, and if the government continues with information programs, most people are going to get vaccinated. Because you know what? Most people do want to go to the cinema. Most people do actually want to go out to parties. Most people actually do want to have a fun life. Most people want to go to work. Most people want to go to public places. It's not Those things are enough of an incentive for them to go. You don't have to force them and threaten them with jail time or with fines. And even if 20 or 30 percent of the, uh, the irrational people in the society don't get vaccinated, you can still achieve all of your aims. They have never proven necessity to us. Let's talk about effectiveness. One thing they said is that more people are going to be vaccinated. That was an underlying claim in the entire case. And they just assume that that's true. They don't really deal with what my second speaker says. She tells you that there's so many people distrust, for example, the, the, the state in those places, like African-Americans in the US. A lot of people, for example, 
have conspiracy theories and more people are going to buy those conspiracy theories if they see the government regular if they see the government enforcing it on them it's going to make them more fearful especially if it's a state that they don't believe and in a lot of states like belarus or dictatorships where like um, anti-free speech laws are associated with oppression you're now associating vaccines with oppression with anti-free speech laws it means fewer people are going to want to get it more people are probably going to protest against the vaccine it's going to become a highly politicized issue because even if everyone can agree on vaccines being administered not everyone can agree that it should be something forced on people and that politicization is going to spread to the vaccine campaigns and it's going to mean fewer people are going to get vaccinated people are going to get vaccinated in a, in, a, in a, 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 it's going to take longer for that to happen so they can't just say oh yeah we're going to get all these people vaccinated they haven't even proven that benefit to us right what we also would say in terms of effectiveness is we say there's simply something that is principally unjust it's not something that you should force on people. Let's also discuss here when it comes to the principle and something that we really think which hasn't been discussed adequately, just how valuable it is, just how important it is that someone make this decision for themselves. The government or the state does not have the right, especially in the instance where it has already failed its obligation to you in terms of education, it has already failed its obligation to you in terms of like ensuring that you're healthy. Uh, uh, if, if it has already failed all those things, why then do they think it is justified in forcing you to get a vaccine? Why do they think it's principally okay for someone bodily autonomy to be undermined, similar to what my second and my first speaker said, simply because it's going to have some sort of benefit to society? Similar to how I told you, you can't, for example, just take blood from someone, even if it's going to save their life, because you have to respect bodily autonomy. On the comparative at the end of the debate, they don't actually have that much more efficacy than us. They actually have a lot less. They haven't proven that there's a necessity for this, given the fact that even if all the people they're talking about don't vaccinate, we still achieve herd immunity and we still get their benefits. And they've never justified to us why criminalization, putting people in jail or finding them, is something which is necessary and appropriate in an instance where it's going to make few people get vaccinated, where it means in an instance where it's not necessary, an instance where it violates the basic principles of bodily autonomy and the freedom of speech. For all those reasons, we're more than proud to oppose. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for your speech. We will now have the reply speech from the opposition side uh, given to us by Alia. Okay, let me just set up my timer. Okay, I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. Panel. Today's debate is about whether governments should be criminalizing, jailing people because they choose not to take the vaccine because of one, misinformation, or two, distrust in the government. Instead of criminalizing vaccine denial, we are advocating as opposition for governments to ask themselves why people aren't taking the vaccine to answer their concerns, to educate the masses. The proposition's policy not only infringes upon people's bodily autonomy and freedom of speech, but it's simply not an effective way of responding to people's concerns about the vaccine, and it's definitely not a more efficient way than the policy we've proposed. In my speech, I will do two things. Number one, I will examine the main clashes in this debate, which were about governments being actors and criminalizing vaccine denial, and two, the efficiency of criminalizing vaccine denial. And finally, I will do some weighing. So number one, first clash, government as actors in criminalizing vaccine denial. They've told you that governments would criminalize people, or in other words, put them through periods of imprisonment and exclusion from society for deciding to either spread misinformation about the vaccine, spread their criticisms about the vaccine, or not take the vaccine whatsoever. However, this policy that the proposition has offered you, panel, gives corrupt governments and governments with restrictive speech measures the power to imprison people. So what do these conditions actually look like? Because the proposition does not want to draw you what that actually looks like, because they know that it's totally invasive and principally wrong. What that actually looks like is people and citizens being being removed from their homes, having their personal privacy and their comfort totally invaded. And so they're encouraging governments to overreach their power and abuse citizens' rights to bodily autonomy, like my third speaker explained, just because we can easily put someone down on the ground and, and vaccinate them and have them vaccinated does not mean that government should because government should respect people's bodily autonomy, their privacy and their rights to uh, privacy. Governments, we, what we've told you, however, is that governments criminalizing vaccine denial principally is just illegitimate because the reality is, is that if people, which is a small minority, are not taking the vaccine, it's because they're not sufficiently educated about the vaccine. The government info campaigns have been ineffective and so government education has failed 
causing distrust in the vaccine. And so the government can't punish you because it failed you. People can't help but deny vaccines given that the, given that the information they were fed was inefficient. So it's difficult to hold someone accountable for something that is hardly their fault and they have not engaged with this analysis whatsoever. Thus, propositions policy detracts the state from holding itself accountable. It shouldn't punish citizens for its own failures. It should address them and correct them. The use of violence to silence opinions from being voiced is not principally viable, especially when those opinions exist largely because of government failure, which will amount to tyranny and oppression, not fair government. This is not a long term solution and it's not an efficient one either. And so in terms of the efficiency of vaccine denial, the efficiency of criminalizing vaccine denial, they've told you that criminalizing people who don't want to take the vaccine will magically result in a decrease in COVID-19 cases, a rise in employment rates and economic growth without any mechanism. And so what we've told you actually is that their policy will do quite the opposite. Instead of actually encouraging people to take the vaccine, what their policy will do is just add fuel to the fire that is people's doubts about the vaccine. It'll encourage people who are already doubtful about the vaccine or who already distrust the government to not take the vaccine whatsoever or to avoid or find ways of not taking it. Or people who were initially okay with taking the vaccine might change their minds after seeing the government's radical punishments and consequences for vaccine denial. So people who were initially willing to take the vaccine will back out because of how eager the government is and how radical it is in the ways that it has enforced vaccination. So the final thing I want to do is some weighing. We believe we've won this debate, but even if you think uh, opposition proposition has, here are two things. Number one, we have the most long-term benefit. Criminalizing people by jailing them or ostracizing them from society only increases citizens' doubts. And number two, we have the greatest accountability. Like we've explained, governments criminalizing people who do not take the vaccine detracts the states from holding itself accountable. Proposition's policy strays away from responsibility while we take it face on. And so for all these reasons, we proudly stand for opposition. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, speaker spoke for four minutes and 40 seconds. Um, now we'll have the final speech of today's debate given to us by Bonita. Okay, let me just set my timer right here. Okay, I will start in three, two, <clears throat> one. Opposition decides that human rights should be so important that even if these different human groups are going to be in danger, even if they bring about the active enforcement of this by government, it actually does the opposite. And how? Because of this active enforcement by government on our side of the house, people are going to be inclined to take this vaccine because they do not want to be on the receiving end of this punishment. For opposition to understand it better, it's a scenario where, let's say, a friend of mine gets punished for doing a certain thing. And because they've gotten punished for this certain thing, I'm going to make sure I don't do that so that I do not get punished. It's almost like that, right? So we see that so far, so for second opposition to bring this ideology of government forcing individuals to get this vaccine will cause them to refuse even more, holds no ground because this government holds a major strength in which this certain citizen does not have one. Yes, it may look like on our side we're the bad guys or the evil people in this debate because we're infringing on people's human rights. But you must understand that we're doing this for a particular reason. And that is something that we have made very clear from first speech. These same people that want to refuse a vaccine are the same people that might die because of these different thoughts that they have out. While we have made it clear from speech one that what we want mainly is safety, we feel like that is something that even if oppositions try to talk and talk and talk about it, this is something that still holds ground on our side. It is so easy to understand propositions case, right? Something we have made clear from the very beginning. It is all about safety. That's all anyone wants, right? And while safety is something that opposition clearly lacks, we feel that their case telling us not to force someone is still not solid enough for it. 
It is unfair that on opposition's world, vaccines are something that can be taken lightly. Conspiracy theories are what they are, conspiracy theories. But despite that, we feel that the, at the end of the day, people need to understand the importance of, you know, the government trying to make them take these different vaccines. Even if we were like, you know, breaching people's body autonomy, this vaccination is something that is a necessary evil. Even if we do like, even if we vaccinate different individuals from different backgrounds or religious, you know, societies, this is something that must be done because it's either refusing to take this vaccine and either getting reprimanded by the government or refusing to take this vaccine, even when you know that you're on, you know, the edge of death or something like that. These minority groups that opposition brings about in today's debate that might be wary of government or these conspiracy theories, the truth of the matter is that people need to make priorities. Is it life or is it going to be your doubt of the government? That is something that opposition has to think about in today's debate. We want to tell you that, yes, we may be actively like forcing these different people, but it is only for a good reason that we're doing these different things. This is something that we have made very clear from speech one, that life is something that we really want to preserve. But if that means that the government will use, you know, different tactics to preserve this life, then we are willing to do so. It is on those grounds that I've never been proud of to propose. Thank you.